uh, how to pray, the things we ought to, and how to get closer uh, to God the Father. And to un even understanding Him uh, and His nature as we pray those things. Are you in this building? Right. Don't neglect that first part where it has the eight compound uh, uh, Hebrew names of God. Jehovah said canoes all the way through Jehovah Rohan, Jehovah Rapha, all those things. Uh, pray, as you pray them every day, listen, you, right now it's a foreign language to you. As you pray them, you'll get to know them. And over time, when you, even 20, 30 years later, uh, things will click for you. Yeah. Things will click for you. Yeah. And there are some times in the same sentence, you, you're thanking him for two or three of them because he is all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, he's Jehovah Rohi. Uh, therefore I shall not want, because he's Jehovah Jireh. Are you in this building? Mm -hmm. Because he restoreth my soul, it goes on to say, which means he's Jehovah Rapha, he's my healer. Yeah. So I mean, just a couple verses, you done hit three of them right there, because it's just who he is. Yeah. And it helps you understand who he is better, the more you understand who he is better, the more you understand his precious promise and his benefits that he has for you. Amen. 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 God is good. Yes, he is. I said God is good, Bonnie. All the time. And all the time. God is good. God is good. Somebody say, wake up, sleepy church. Wake up, sleepy church. <laughs> Woo! Amen. So, don't just get religious about it. Get relationship about it. Because God is good. We put that together for you. It's good stuff. If you just did each section of six sections in one minute that would be speed praying uh, it would take you six minutes that's probably six minutes more than some of you's been praying a day so that's all right start with the six yes and you can go to two minutes and make it 12. jesus said could you not tarry with me for one hour that's only 10 minutes sometimes you can't even do it in 10 minutes when you really get caught up in his presence and glory really get to praying up a storm and that's all right too in the brother Robert. I found myself three hours later still trying to get to the end of that thing. But, but not every day, because sometimes, you know, we ain't got three hours every day. Are you in this boat? Is this microphone working? Today, or the eighth week, um, probably nine because we missed a week because of the flood, uh, we're going to talk about prayer again. Isn't that right? Yes. <laughs> but today, more specifically, uh, we're going to talk about unanswered prayer. How many of you ever had an unanswered prayer? Mm -hmm. oh, we all have. Yep. If you haven't, get used to it. Because a lot of them don't get answered, do they, Brother Robbie? And there's a lot of reasons, and we're going to look at some of them reasons today. Uh, maybe we should, maybe one of them things should just be a big question mark because we just really don't know. <laughs> Garth Brook addressed that back in the 80s or early 90s with a song called I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. Only one person ever listened to country music in the 80s. Yep. Not three of you. Four of you, well, the rest of you, I don't know what y'all were listening to. But. <laughs> In his song, Unanswered Prayer, he thanked God for not answering his prayer as a young man when he was dating his little first love. And how many of you remember your little first loves? And you got all these goosebumps and feelings, and you just think they're the greatest thing. And uh, years later, you look back at a high school reunion, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> what was I thinking? is another country song. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Young and wasn't thinking because he didn't know. You couldn't see the end at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But he had seen his little high school love, sweetheart, whatever, infatuation, probably what it really was. And uh, thank God that God didn't answer his prayers and, yeah. and, and give that little thing to him to be his wife because now years later with his wife, he's like, whoo! Lord. Years ago, I went and did a wedding just before we moved here. Ann and I had been married for a little while, about 12 years, and I run into uh, 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 someone I had dated for a short period of time, and Anna looked at me and she said, aren't you glad that didn't work out? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> she said, you did good, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. <laughs> Sometimes we thank God for unanswered prayers. We don't always see it in the moment. But God knows what's best. Yes, he does. Um, 
And as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed uh, for God to take the cup for him, for God to save humanity any other way than his death. But then he said this, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. I'm not looking forward to this death thing. So if you can think of another way, God, I'm all ears. But if not, I'll go forth with your plan. Sometimes we pray and we have to say it nevertheless every once in a while. Not my will. This is what I like, what I want. But nevertheless, your will be done because that's what important. You see the bigger picture. Amen. That's why we're to ask the Holy Spirit to pray through us. And we need to yield to him and let him do that. Are you in this book? Because the Bible says only the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God, the Father. And, and he will help us and intercede through us if we let him. Uh, to pray the perfect will of the Father. Do I have any Holy Ghost people here today? That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Amen. So that's why you need to yield. And, and there are some times I just pray and then I just say, you know what, Holy Spirit, uh, have a little talk to the Father for me. Because maybe I was selfish. Maybe I'm just, you know, praying everything that I want God to do and he's not doing it and getting frustrated with it. So Holy Spirit, just take this thing over, have a little chat with the Father and uh, help me to get his will and you, you know, talk to him about the will and let's just get his will figured out here. And then translate it back to me. Yes. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Ain't no need just him telling the Father. He needs to tell me too. I kind of need to get on board with it. So today, on Ancient Prayer, really kind of a prescription, prescriptive warning uh, to prevent a breakdown in our prayer life because we all uh, run into those roadblocks from time to time. I'm going to look at about six things today. Number one, uh, one of the first a roadblocks we run into that causes unanswered prayer is idolatry. Say idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry was big in the Old Testament. They worshiped idols. More blatant about it, you know. They worshiped golden calves, and statues. Now, then, you know, obviously, there are statues and Buddha and, and silly things like that still going on today, but it was in, uh, very uh, prevalent in the Old Testament. And even in the wilderness, God's own people, while Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments, Aaron's watching them. They get bored for 40 days and they make a yeah. golden calf. Took their jewelry, burned it, and melted it, and made golden calf. Started worshiping the stupid thing. Isn't that just silly? Moses came down, got some man, he broke the Ten Commandments. Had to go back up for another 40 days and pray and fast and get, get another set. Idolatry. Ezekiel, chapter 14, verse 3, says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols. Not on a statue. But Ezekiel says, in their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. Today, there's a lot of people who have modern day idols in their hearts. Maybe they don't have a golden calf, maybe they don't worship an image. The Bible says you don't you have to make any graven images and worship it. You say, well, I don't do that. But sometimes we have idols in our heart. These men, instead of idols in their heart, have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their, their sin, their iniquity. Amen. And God said, should I be consulted by them at all? Should I be sought after, prayed to by them at all? An idol is anything, say anything. Anything. Let's make sure you're awake. Right now. Anything <laughs> that you put before God is an idol. Matthew 6, 33, everybody knows it. Seek first, first, the kingdom of God in his righteousness. Yes. And he said, yes. all these other things shall be taken care of for you. Yes. Put God's business first, he'll take care of yours. Put God first. You know, the Bible says don't put your family before God. Don't put your children before God. Don't put your parents. Don't put your spouse before God. You put God first. Amen. Because he can take care of everything else. He can change in a moment, but we can't change in a lifetime. God is first. Say this with me. I'm not going to hell for nobody. I ain't going to hell for nobody. Not even a relative. Not even a relative. Love you. Not going to hell with you. Or for you. Ann and I, we like to watch these singing TV shows, you know. And I believe the last one was uh, uh, Singing Show we were watching. 
and they have a former contestant from many years ago. He was a teenager back then and many years ago, and he come back and they let him sing a song, which they shouldn't have did because it was horrible. Absolutely pathetic. He great, you know, great voice, he got a good voice. And uh, he grew up, I think, uh, I can't remember. Anyway, some religion he grew up in, and, uh, and his mother said he, they, they, they considered him very religious. Well, uh, just a year or two ago, he decided to come out of the closet and reveal to the world that he was gay and wanted to be gay. And uh, he got excommunicated out of the, the church he was in um, because he was openly gay, wasn't repenting of that sin. And so the mother got mad because she'd been, you know, part of that uh, religion for a long, long time. Wasn't, wasn't Christianity. I think it was Jehovah's Witness or something, or Mormons or something. Maybe it was Mormonism because it was in Utah. And uh, they got, uh, he got kicked out of church. So the mother said, she said this to him, and he wrote a song about it. She said, if you're going to go to hell, I'm going to go to hell with you. And so he wrote a song called that. You know, I'll go to hell with you. I thought, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> you censor us and don't let us put stuff on TV, and you're going to put that mess on TV and let that kid sing that mess, I'll go to hell with you, Mama said. And they were all like laughing and celebrating. Oh, Mama's going to go to hell with you because the church rejected it. Isn't that horrible? Yes. Well, I think it's horrible, whether you do or not, anyway, because it's stupid. Going to hell for nobody. That's right. I can love you on this side of the earth all day long. We can sit and chat and eat, eat, eat peanut butter Captain Crunch till we're blue in the face, but I am not going to hell with you. Yeah. You want to go, you're on your own. <laughs> hey, to the men. Mm. Ain't nobody worth it. I can love you here and hug you here, but mm -mm. I love him. Yes. He's the one that died for me. He's the one that saved me. He hadn't turned his back on me. Anything you put before God is an idol. Yeah. What are some modern day idols? Oh, there's tons of them. Probably varies in difference with different people. Automobiles can be an idol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was 16 years old. I bought a 1967 Mustang for 600 bucks. And it looked like it. But I had a vision. Brother Jim, I had a vision. Worked all summer and painted that blue Mustang bright red with some black stripes on it. Kept working and got them hubcaps off of there and got me some aluminum wheels. I had to start out with some used ones. <laughs> and some six some used ones, used tires, but they were they were aluminum. And years later I bought some center lines, more shiny ones, with some fifties in this place. It had a little six cylinder in it, but that lasted about a year or two. Well, next summer I saved money. And I bought a, a bigger engine, a V8. And then we built it up a little bit, got it up to 375 horsepower. Jeez. Somebody say, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> then had the interior redone over the year. I had this car for six years, so redid all the interior on it. Had automatic and put a four-speed in it. Some little scripture, I'm going to church, I'm 16, 17, 18 years old. I mean, I had chrome on the engine. Had the engine painted bright blue, Ford blue, and I'd go out and had chrome. I'd get Windex out there on the weekends. I'd spray that thing, get the dust off of it, get all my chrome shined up under the hood. I'd be out there for 30 minutes shining the engine and the hub. Anybody? Did anybody do that besides me? <laughs> no? Did you do it there? Kelly probably did too. Did you do it, Brother Jim? No? Okay. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> and I heard a sermon kind of like this, and I, I got convicted. Maybe that car is your idol. I thought, ooh, I don't want the car to be my idol, but I sure do like it. I put that car before Daddy. I might be an hour late because I'm, I'm cleaning the chrome on this thing. <laughs> this is my baby. <laughs> Automobiles, homes. If you put your home before the Lord, it can be an idol. How about the human body? The human body is a big, big idol today, isn't it? Whether it's your body, there's some people who are workout freaks that uh, their body is more important to them than God. They spend more time in the gym than they do in prayer. I know people go to go to the gym three hours a day, but probably don't pray more than three minutes a day. Something's wrong with this picture. I said something's wrong with this picture. And if it's not our body, sometimes we worship and idolize uh, other people's bodies because they're beautiful. And all the right curves and all the right places. And it's just 
that messes this up and it just becomes an idol. You're consumed with it. Are you in this place? Somebody said, well, maybe 40 years ago, preacher. But... <laughs> <laughs> we make idols. How about sports? Can we say that in church? Sometimes sports can be an idol. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Well, oh, it's quiet in this building. Anything you put before the Lord can be an idol. All right, number two. Number two. Second thing that causes unanswered prayer is blatant sin. Now, I originally wrote down sin, but it got a little controversial because God's a God of grace. And every time we, you know, sin, which is often, uh, it doesn't mean God quits hearing us because that would be, a, that would be an ongoing on again, off again, on again, off again, uh, Jekyll and Hyde thing all day long. But God's grace is bigger than that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But there's this thing called blatant sin. Rebellious, willing, unwilling to change sin that 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 kind of changes the whole uh, sin perspective. Are you in this place? Because yes. we all sin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we got sin in our life, we're not even aware of it, not even convicted of it yet. But there's a difference in that and knowingly, willingly, on purpose, if you don't like it, you can kiss my shoes kind of attitude. That's a difference. And how many know that's a problem? When somebody accepts their sin and it's normal to them and they refuse, listen to me, refuse to repent of it, there's a problem. God's got a problem with that. I said God has a problem with that. He knows all of us are going to sin, but he expects us to repent. But it's when we get to a point that we refuse to repent that there's an issue. And now our, our, our prayers are hindered. They're not answered. Because we're not obeying God. Amen. There's an issue like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. In the Mormon church, even they acknowledged such a blatant sin was an issue in their religion as well. They kicked this young man out of the church. For his blatant uh, acceptance of homosexuality, he would not repent of it. He accepted it and said, you're going to accept me with this? And they said, no, that's blatant sin that you're not repenting of. And so they removed it, which is biblical. Whether it's Mormonism or Christianity, it's biblical. 1 Corinthians 5.11, uh, there's a story here, chapter 5. And it begins in the beginning like this. That Paul comes to the Corinthian church and he says, look, I'm hearing reports and I'm not very proud of you for this, that there is a young man in your church who is sleeping with his stepmother, his father's wife. And apparently, you, the church, know about it, but you're not doing anything about it. But you know about it. And you haven't called him out on it. But, but y'all are all gossiping about it because it got all the way to me and I'm not even in Corinth. In Corinth. Why, Paul is saying to the church, why haven't you dealt with this? Are you in this book? Now you remember uh, in Jesus' days in the Gospels, uh, they brought to Jesus a woman caught in the very act of adultery. And they said, hey, can we take a stone? Can we stone her? Can we go Old Testament and do, do under the law and stone this woman caught in adultery? Jesus wrote some things in the dirt, looked back up on them and said, okay. Any of you who this has never sinned, cast the first stone. Go ahead. One by one, they started to leave because they all have had sin in their life uh, and couldn't cast the stone on Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone. She said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way. You're forgiven. There's grace. But sin no more. See, Jesus came preaching grace and truth. There's both. Amen. And there's a balance to both. Amen. God gives us grace. There's an end to it if we violate it. Hebrews says, don't insult the spirit of grace. Trample underfoot the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't count it unworthy. Don't re rebelliously, blatantly live in sin, knowingly refuse to repent. Don't do it. And so he addresses the church, why haven't you dealt with this? Verse 11, actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. 
so-called Christian. See, Paul's calling this man now a so-called Christian. Probably been saved. Probably got dipped in water and got baptized. You in this place? Somewhere along the, the way, he lost his path, fell into an adulterous, fornicative relationship with his father's wife, his stepmother. And people know about it. But nobody's rebuking them and commanding them to stop. So Paul says with this so-called Christian, this so-called brother, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Why? He goes on to say a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. It comes from this passage of scripture. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little rebellion that's unrepented of and unaddressed can spread like an infectious disease throughout the whole body and mess you all up because you think, well, he can live that way. Maybe I can live that way too. And, and God is love after all, right? God is love, but he has a standard. He loves us too much to leave us in a mess. Those whom the Lord loves, he rebukes, he chastises, he disciplines, he corrects. Amen. He won't leave you in your mess. He has grace for you. But if you don't change, he's got a whooping for you. Right. <laughs> Anybody ever had a whooping? All right, some of you got whipped. When I was a kid, I got this flat out beat. <laughs> it went past whooping into beating. <laughs> we can make fun of my parents next week when they're here for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably still need therapy for some of my beatings. <laughs> my mother said, stop it. <clears throat> Blatant sin, one that one refuses to repent of. You know, as a, as a pastor, as a church, Christians, we, we hope we never see the day that we have to deal with such blatant sin in, the, in this church that we have to rebuke somebody and say, look, that's, you got to stop. And, and they basically say, that's none of your business. You need to mind your own business. I'm going to do what I want to. And get to the point where we have to say, uh, if you don't repent, you're going to have to go. Because the Bible says we're not even to eat with someone that rebellious, calling themselves a Christian, but that blatantly, in your face, with that, that's pretty blatant. You repent, or you're going to have to go. Now, yeah, this is not a strike, strike one. We don't need to get hyper and go around. Okay, they said a cuss word. Hey, repent, brother, or you're going to get kicked out of the church. No, let's not get crazy with it. Amen? Come on. Paul come in, rebuked the guy, kicked him out of the church, told him not to even eat with him. There come a time he repented. Paul had to go back to the church and say, hey, be a little tough on him now. He repented. Let's welcome him back. Those of you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and gentleness because that's the goal. Yeah. Repentance. Yeah. Reconciliation. But some of them were still hard. Like, no, you're not coming back. So they went overboard. First, they wouldn't even talk to him about it. Now they won't even let him back. Come on, somebody. We have a tough crowd today. All right, number three. We'll just move right on until we find, find your weakness. <laughs> All right, the third reason we get on to unanswered prayer is unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. Unforgiveness. We addressed unforgiveness in the Lord's Prayer because it dealt with it. The only part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus reiterated as soon as he said amen, he come right back to it. And we'll, we'll get that one on the second scripture. But this first one, Mark 11, 25 and 26, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, if you have anything against anyone, we probably most of us do. All right? No? Being the only one with a mirror today. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. It's pretty bold, pretty, pretty out there, pretty matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But God said it, not me. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, 
24. Jesus throws us a curveball here. If any of you presenting your offering at the altar, all right, in church, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now, the last scripture, he says, if you have something against somebody else, forgive them. Now he flips the switch and says, uh, if you're there and you remember that your brother has something against you, you don't take some people off. Got some people mad at you, ruffled some feathers. Huh? Leave your offering there before the altar. In other words, hit the timeout button on your prayer. Timeout. God says, don't, don't deal with me yet. Go get it right with them. Then come back and we'll talk. Leave your offering there before the altar. Go first, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. It's awful quiet in this church today. If someone has an issue with you, get it right or try to. It takes two to tango. It takes two to reconcile. They don't always accept it, but do your part. Do your part, church. And then come back to God. He said, we'll talk. So that affects your prayer, did not it? Unforgiveness affects your prayer. Because you're asking God to forgive you. He says, hold up, you haven't forgiven so and so. You got issues with them. Get it right. Get it right. We'll chat. Amen. No, no, leave your gift. I want to hear about it right now. Go get it right and come back and we'll chat. So sometimes we got to say, time out, okay. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Get it right. And the Lord will lead you to do it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Come on, Christian. We're Christ like once. We can do this. All right, number four. The fourth. Thing that calls in as a prayer in our lives found in James chapter 1. It's called unbelief. Unbelief. A lack of faith. We all deal with it sometimes. Don't know why we get in the flesh. Try to do things in our flesh. We want to make it happen. But we have to believe in the Lord. James 1 5 7. If any of you lack wisdom, you know how to do something. Let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. When you don't know how to do it, ask the Lord, because he knows how to do it. Isn't that right? Wisdom's knowing how to do something. How something needs to be handled. How something, uh, what, what, the, what the answer to it is, what the conclusion to it is. God, has, he's got wisdom. He knows how to solve the unsolvable. Like he did with Solomon. He gave him wisdom. This is how you do it. But he must ask in faith. Without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. The, wind, uh, the wave of the sea. Driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. It goes on to say that a double minded person is unstable in all other ways. God bless you. So when you ask God, believe he's going to give you the answer. If you don't, your prayer is not getting answered. In fact, that goes for anything you pray for. Anything you pray for, believe that God's going to do it or don't pray it. If you don't believe it, don't even pray it out of your mouth. Why even pray? If you haven't doubted, and you're not sure if God's going to do it. You don't need to pray. You need to read the Bible. Because mm. faith comes by hearing yes. the word of God. Amen. Amen, amen Brother Parker. Yes. yes. <laughs> I said amen. Amen. The Bible doesn't say to pray for faith. It says to read for faith. Yes. And to listen. Yeah. Faith comes by hearing God's word. That's why you got to read the Bible. To know what God said. Then you come into agreement with what God said. Then you get faith for it. If you want faith, you don't pray for it. You read for it. Then you believe. Yes. All right, number five. Moving right along. Number five, impure motives. Sometimes our prayers are not answered because our motives are not right. Our heart's not right. Got the wrong motives. Yeah. I was 30 years old. I used to pray. God would bring thousands of people to that little church with, with 
Started with nine people. Got up to 1823, thousands of people. Tens of thousands. I said, God, I'm 30 years old. I should have 10,000 people right now. Where are they at? Don't they know I'm here? What's wrong with these people? Lord had to take me down a humble road. I was in Bible college. I had no problem telling you I was going to be the next latest, greatest, big time preacher. Dressed like it, walked like it, talked like it, acted like it. He would say, why are you dressed up like that? I said, because I know who I am. He said, what do you mean? He said, I'm a professional. <laughs> I wear a suit and tie to, to college. He said, you don't have to wear all that. I said, no, I'm a professional. I know where I'm going. You don't understand. I'm going to be one of the top three preachers in this country. By the time I'm 30 years old, I'll have 10,000 people in my church. I'm on television every day. Because I thought that's what success was. Because when I watch TV, that's, that's, that's what I see. Are you in this book? Mm -hmm. Didn't have a mentor. Didn't have a father figure spiritually back then. So what do you do? You look to media. Yeah. So I pray and ask God with impure motives what seemed like was a good thing. It was all about me. It wasn't about his ministry. It was about Dean's desires. I mean, no, he didn't answer that prayer. Maybe you had things you prayed for. And you found out later your heart wasn't right. You wasn't asking for the right motive. All right, James 4, 3. You ask and you do not receive because. Well, there it is. Because. See, that's pretty, pretty blunt right there. You ask and you don't get why. Because you ask with wrong motives. So that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Because it's about you, not about God. When you start praying things that's about you and not about God, you might just be asking with wrong motives. We cannot... Ask God. You see that at the bottom of your screen? We cannot ask God to do something for us when we refuse to do what he asked us to do. Oh, oh that's where it comes in church. Over the running. Can't ask God to do something for you when you refuse to do what he's already told you to do. That's good. Right here in this book. Mm -hmm. He's given us a whole lot of things to do. When you refuse to do it, you tie his hands. Yeah. I said you tie his hands. Why should he respond to you when you're not obeying? Trust and obey. There's no other way. Amen. You ask a myth. Wrong motives. Wrong purpose. It's kind of like gambling. You know, getting out the dice. Why even pray? We're praying. We're hoping to roll some lucky sevens. Maybe God will answer this one. <laughs> That'll work like that, does it? A lot of people throw up dice, call them prayers. Hopefully I get lucky today and God will answer this thing. Here's a big one. We pray for God to bless us, to be wealthy, to be rich. Have you ever prayed that? We probably all prayed that. And we don't even tithe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's right. From him anyway. That mean people don't get rich uh, without it because they do. But it's not his blessing that did it. Mm -hmm. The blessing of the Lord make it rich and addeth no sorrow with it, the Bible says. Yeah. There's all kinds of scriptures about this. We're not going to have a prosperity sermon today, but there's all kinds of scriptures about how God can bless you. There's also a lot of warnings to the rich when God has blessed you of how you're not to let that be an idol to you yeah. and you're to give. Jesus dealt with a rich young ruler. That, man, he lived, his, he lived everything right, but that right there, it had him. He put it before the Lord. Sometimes it becomes a little game we're playing with God, asking him to do something that we're rebelling against, his instructions for. Sometimes we play, God, if, if you'll do this, I'll do that. No, 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 God, don't play games. It's not let's make a deal. Right? Let's make a deal. God, if you'll do this, I'll never cuss again. I'll never drink another drop of that alcohol ever again. If you'll just do this one thing. 
He doesn't cut deals like that. If you obey me, yes. he says. That's right. Not the way things work. So we cannot ask God to do something for us when we refuse to do what he's asked us to do right here. I've had people come up and say, Pastor, pray, pray the Lord bless us financially. Do you tithe? No. Then I can't pray the Lord bless you because he's not. Hmm. It's not going to get answered. I said it's not going to get answered. Well, I can't afford to tithe. No, you can't afford not to tithe. Amen. So I can't pray something that contradicts his word and that contradicts his scripture. That's right. Amen. All right, we'll move on. Number six. The last one, prayers that don't get answered, we're talking about unanswered prayer, is an unhealthy marriage. Now, that's a can of worms. That's a whole sermon or a series that we don't have time to scratch and sniff today. So <laughs> I'm really not going to be able to do this justice, okay? Can't really climb up into this and get the depths of it or even really lay the foundation for it of what unhealthy can be. But I'm going to take a stab at it. Is that all right? Probably going to ruffle some feathers, but I just, just know that you're not getting the full package deal because we don't have time for that. Lord, I'm just addressing some things that God says will cause your prayers to be hindered and unanswered. Is that okay? Yes. Can we throw that out there? Yes. Brother Ronnie says yes, so we're going to go with Pastor Ronnie over here. <laughs> what is an unhealthy marriage? Sometimes, I mean, there's, there's so many different ways because it's very diverse. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter addresses uh, marriage. Right there from verse 1, it starts. He goes on even past verse 7. But for sake of time, we're going to shorten it up and give you the short version of it. Peter's telling the, the people, the congregation there, he said, look, basically here's, here's, here's the summed up gist of it. God is a God of order. Do you believe that? If you don't, you need to get on board. God's a God of order. He's a structured God. And he, he has a purpose in doing everything. There was Adam. There was Eve. Am I right? Yeah. Remember them? Great, great, super, super, super great grandparents. Adam and Eve. God put Adam as the one in authority. As man. He gave man authority in the home. Is that right? On track, Brother Ronnie? God gave the man authority uh, over his home. Now, God holds those in authority accountable. When he gives you an assignment, he holds you accountable to it. Isn't that right? Just nod your head, yes. Just go with it. Hey, just go with it. I don't like where this is going, but just go with it. <laughs> All right. 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 6, and he said, okay. Uh, just as Sarah, that's Abraham's wife, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. Uh, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Let all the women just say a big amen right there. Amen. You need to understand me. Now that's kind of a trick statement because you're never going to understand a woman. And all the men said, Amen. But didn't say understand her, but in an understanding way. <laughs> There's a difference, Ron. <laughs> I can try to have an understanding way about you, but I don't know what in the world, what planet that just came from. Because we're different. <laughs> all the women said, yes, we are very different. That's why it works. Because we're so different. So the husbands in the same way with your wives live with them in an understanding way as with someone weaker. Now all the women said, boo, it's Bible, so just go with it. Don't throw stones. Said she is a woman. And show her honor. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. 
Treat her like a daughter of Almighty God. Because she is. So that your prayers will not be hindered. Really, this prayer to be hindered can go with both sides of that script there. Because any time an unhealthy marriage is when either one is not fulfilling their godly duty in the marriage. Now that's a big openness, and that goes on and on and on right there, okay? And we ain't got time to break that one down. God's put the, the man uh, with authority in the home. And he's told the wife, just go with it. Or just go with it. Doesn't mean he's got to, you know, flex on you, or, you know, and you got to be a little puppet on the string. But in a sense, you know, he, make, he makes fun. Doesn't mean you can't, can't have a conversation with him. I really don't think that's a great idea because we see women all through the Bible say, uh, honey, time out. I don't think that's a good idea. And he listened to her, and it was wisdom, and he changed his mind, and they were right like Abigail. Mm -hmm. Abigail talked David out of killing. Are you, come on. Be in this place. Yeah. Yeah. So husbands, listen to your wife. Honor them. They're usually right. That's hard to say. Sometimes they're usually right. Listen to them. Sometimes they're blatantly wrong. Don't listen to them. They're emotional mess. Sometimes they're on to something. Usually when a bad spirit comes into a church, uh, the ladies are the first to know about it. Can we just be honest? Mm -hmm. And they'll come up and say, uh, Pastor, uh, that lady over there, she ain't right. I'm like, who, who, who? Normal to me. I'm telling you something about her just ain't right. A couple weeks later, you find out she's a witch. Oh, didn't see that one coming. Well, that woman did. She had a little sensor in her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The radar went off. <laughs> I was in the middle of doing a service one time, Ron. And we were in worship, and I had one lady on the worship team came to me. The lady on the second row is a witch. About that time, the lady on the second row come to me and says, that lady right there is a witch. I said, all right, which one of you is a witch? <laughs> I know both of you. I know you're both pretty good. Which one of you is a witch? Never did figure that one out. <laughs> Maybe they both were. <laughs> They wanted to tattle on the other one, though, just as fast as they could. Okay. Where were we going with that? Jerry's house? Curveball. I did pre-marriage counseling for my cousin back in 1999. And he was, he was Airborne Ranger, brother Brother Jim. Young, cocky. Probably a little more cocky than I was back then, and I was pretty cocky. He didn't just want to go to the Mediterranean, he wanted a tough branch. But, you know, airborne ranger. And he got out. Later on, he got married. He still got the chest bowed out. Still got that strut. Married a country girl from Kentucky. Did pre-marriage counseling with him, right? Did the whole duties of a man, all the duties of the man found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 33. Your husband's got to be the, the head of the wife and got, you know, got to nurture her and love her, cherish her. I think he missed all of that for he's the head of the wife. That's the only thing you heard, the head of the wife. Right? Wife's got to, got to reverence her husband, respect him, blah, blah, blah. He didn't hear anything else. She has to respect me and I'm the head of the wife. That's the only, the only two words he heard. He didn't hear love and nurture and respect and all. He didn't hear none of that other stuff. He just heard I'm the head. And so uh, about a year later, she was she, I seen her again. She was mad at me. Mad at me because I put you know, it's in the vows, right? So the husband rubs her up. Why did you put that in the vows? So, well, she's liable. so then she later on gets to, to tell me how he flexes on her. You have to mind me, I'm the head of the wife. You just and he didn't go to church. <laughs> I mean, right. that. Kind of like lost your right when you don't go to church. You're not, you're not going to be a good head of the wife if you don't go to That's church. Right. You're, you're flexing on this. 
You heard the preacher. You got to. You heard the preacher. You got to obey me, woman. So hush. This cat didn't even have a job, Brother Ronnie. She had a college degree. She was a, I forget what she was, but she had a college degree. She had a good job. Her daddy was a millionaire. She had a really good job, highly educated. And, and so she made all the money. He's at home. He wasn't doing anything. Here once a while, he drove a bulldozer. He's a redneck from Texas. She come home, bought her a whole new uh, living room set of furniture. Spent a lot of money on it. She come home from work the next day. He rearranged the whole living room. She mad as a hornet. Oh, what can you hear? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. She is mad as a hornet. Why did you change this furniture I had arranged in here? He said, because I'm the head of the house, woman, and you got to do what I say. Mm -hmm. He's like, whoa, that's my money. I bought that furniture with my money while you're sitting on my couch on your lazy hand and not doing nothing. I paid for it. It's my money. He said, it's my house. I'm the head of the house. Did you hear my cousin preacher? You got to do what I say. Uh -oh. It's not the way this thing works. Uh -uh. Time out. Somebody say time out. Time out. Sometimes you got to hit the time out button and read the book for what it really says. Amen. It's not a sit down, shut up, and don't ask questions Bible, is it? Mm -hmm. No. Sometimes we miss the forest for the trees, and sometimes we got controlling power issues, and, and we need to listen to God. Because God doesn't do that to us, and He's our head. He doesn't say, Dean, sit down and shut up and don't say a word because I'm the head of you. You just have to do what I say all the time, and you're not, you're not even can't even ask me questions. God doesn't do that. He loves us. He loves us. You can't miss the forest for the trees. This is not a personality thing because there are women who have a stronger personality than their husband. It's okay. God pairs people like that. It's okay. So well, she wears the pants in the family. Well, then let her wear them. But she's still got to, it may be a little tougher for her, but she's got to find a way to let him make the decision because he has to answer for God for it, not her. She has to answer, is she letting him? Is she submitting is she bring, the word subjection means bring yourself under the authority of another. Every time you go to work, you bring yourself under the authority of another you have to. You probably think they're wrong half the time, but you bring yourself under their authority while you're mumbling. They're the boss. They're the one that's got to answer for it. It's their business. I do it a different way. That's the way they want it done. Bless God, that's the way we're going to do it, right? So stronger personality to women, you got to bite your tongue sometimes. It's tough. It's tough. And you got to let him answer. Don't mean you can't voice that opinion. Voice it in the godliest way you can. Come on, that same scripture says if you have a, a husband that's unbelieving. The Bible says win him by your holy behavior, your holy conversation. Live right for God before him. You can win him with that. He needs to see that you're a godly woman and that you respect him as a man. Not finger pointing him. Well, you don't even go to church, Joey, and I ain't doing nothing you say. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> All right, stand to your feet. Let's go. Worship team, let's go. Let's land this plane. None of us want our prayers unanswered. So the bottom line we need to follow the Lord. We need to follow his book, the Bible. We need to obey it. Often, we have to make adjustments. That's what life is. It? It's making adjustments. You find out the truth. You get a revelation. And you say, yes, Lord. It's kind of like marriage, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> I always tell the young man every time I do pre-marriage counseling, I say, look at me. This young 20-year-old guy, he said, say this with me. It's going to be hard to do. I am sorry. He's like, I'm no, say it. Say it right now. I'm sorry. Two words. I said, get good at it. Get good. Practice it. Look in the mirror. I'm sorry. Very important in a marriage. Would you agree? Very important. Oh, come on, all the married people. It's very important to marriage to say, I'm 
Sorry, which includes, I was wrong. Now that's hard, it's hard to fix the mouth to say it. You have to get good at it. If you want to be a good Christian, you have to get good at I'm sorry and I was wrong. That's right. Have to. Yep. Because we are. We're wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. God is always right. Make the adjustment and get it right. That's why we need to keep praying this Lord's Prayer. Give you a copy of it today as a model. Keep praying it. I promise you, if you will keep praying it, your relationship with God will grow over time. I've been doing this a long time. My relationship is still growing through the Lord's Prayer because while I'm doing it, I get a revelation, more revelation still, 30 years later, revelation still about things that, I, maybe I already knew it, maybe just hadn't thought about it a long time, just, just a revelation today about who God is. Yes. I get overwhelmed, just thank Him and praise Him, oh, thank you, you know, I already knew it, but it's just, a right now, revelation, it helps me in my relationship with Him. Keep praying that Lord's Prayer every day. Most of these things we talked about today, these six reasons we have an answer for, most of them will begin to take care of themselves as you draw close to God. They just do. Because when you get close to Him, he, you know, you, you, you feel His presence, you feel His conviction, He'll lead you, He'll help you forgive, He'll deal with you on it, He'll help you do it, because He'll remind you that He did it for you. So continue to pray and grow in the Lord. All right, let's stand. Let's worship. Because God...